Well, do we have an interesting show for you guys today or what? So many of you out there in the uh, the world of social medias have demanded, screamed, and requested, find a Scientology person. And boy, did I not disappoint you all. So I would like to proudly welcome Mr. Legendary Russell Shaw to the show. You can go this ahead. Is, I am Russell Shaw. I'm yeah. the legendary Russell Shaw, and I feel welcomed on this show, Amanda. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I literally have you in my phone as legendary Russell Russell Shaw oh, because cool. <laughs> Justin ha, Justin Mercer has you in his phone uh-huh. as that. So I just copied him. <laughs> oh well, that's fine. That's Fantastic. Literally cool has it in there as that. And I'm like, uh-huh. okay, I, I'm saving it exactly that way. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, just calling me Russ or Russell works just fine too. So all right, perfect. Yeah. So I have some scouts out there in the world mm-hmm. that were scouting for me, and your name was brought mm-hmm. to my attention. And mm-hmm. I so me as a real estate agent, I know you as the, the God of real estate out here in Arizona, like you are the all be all out here. So when your name got uh, brought to me as Scientology, I'm thinking, no way, no way. (laughs) So a long time ago, I had added you on Facebook years ago. And so of course Uh I go back to Facebook and I'm scrolling through and I'm like, he really is. This is real. And yeah. I was super nervous to call you. And Justin's like, don't be nervous. Just call him. So yeah. <laughs> I drummed up the courage because I'm not a cold uh-huh. call type of person. <laughs> yeah. Made the call. And you were so, so sweet on the phone. And just, yeah, like, let's do this. So I'm super thankful and super happy that you're willing to participate. Well, it's my pleasure. It's seriously. And thank you for having me. Yes. And, there's so uh, many curious not- people out yeah. there. So many people that are just so curious. It's just because it's different. It's not your average yeah. religion. And it's just so different. No. So people are just in awe and shock over this. And they and they just want to know more. So, yeah. Let's start well, it I'm off. I'm happy to accommodate. I'll answer any question I can. If you ask me something I don't know, that has to be my answer. I don't know. Perfect. But if I know the answer, I'm happy to, to answer it. And I, I've been a, uh, a Scientologist since 1973, so I have quite a bit of familiarity with it. Um, I, I've had quite a bit of training, and I've had quite a bit of the spiritual counseling, and uh so yeah, uh, just so starting start out, you want to start. 1973. Okay, what happened in your life that in 1973 where you just said, you know what, I need to seek a higher power in a different way? Well, it was a twofold thing. So the first thing to say is I had found out that Scientology existed 12 years before that. Um, I was. Uh, uh, 27 when I got into Scientology, but I was, I'm trying to remember, uh, it, it seems like I, I was, I, I wasn't, yeah, I was about 15. My uncle had taken me to a Scientology uh, lecture, and it honestly seemed really interesting, but it seemed too good to be true. I don't know how else I'd describe it, it just seemed too good to be true. And I, didn't really investigate it much at all. I did read a book called Problems of Work. That mm-hmm. uh, first book I read, a Scientology book I read, is called Problems of Work by L. Ron Hubbard. And I actually loved it. Even when I was 15, I've subsequently read it three or four times. I have used the information from that book. I would say I have helped thousands, personally helped thousands of people with that information. Um, if you say, what is Scientology? Like, that, that'd be the first thing. But let me just, I mean, I want to cover some stuff to define it. Mm-hmm. So the, it, it is called uh, an applied religious philosophy. And I want to kind of take that apart and put it back together. Okay. So the word Scientology comes from two words. It comes from skio, and, uh, which is Latin, and it comes from the Greek word logos. Mm-hmm. Logos in the ver- English version of logos, literally not the word or word, but in English you would find it as ology, like study of, yeah. like biology, study of bio, uh, geology is the study of geo, this, this sort of thing. So biology is living things or life forms. 
Scio comes from the Latin, uh, which basically means knowing or knowledge. It is the same root word that science comes from. So if you said, what is Scientology? Literally, it is knowing how to know. It's the study of knowing. It is quite literally the study of knowing. And when we talk about knowing something, we're not talking about data. You could get an example, does somebody know something? Does this mean they could talk about it? Nope. In fact, the person might know something that they couldn't easily talk about. And I don't mean because it's a forbidden subject. Yeah. If, you saw, if I saw someone walk into a room, I could make the correct observation. They know how to walk. You could get that now. Is that but what separates this... you guys from regular, you know, just just traditional Christianity because it's not based off knowing facts. It's about feelings and higher powers that way. And then you no, guys go off No, I would not facts. say that at all. No, I, I would absolutely not say that. Well, that's good. So it, it's an applied religious philosophy, and I'll cover every part of it. Because I know I'm, that Ron I'm, Hubbard uh, specialized uh-huh. writing science fiction and fantasy, and when he came up with Scientology and writing these books, a lot of people were kind of a little thrown off back in the day, and this is like after uh-huh. World War II was – uh-huh. Because he he basically was a science fiction novelist, so and a lot of people. Well, he actually wrote a lot of stuff. He, he literally wrote he wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories, but he wrote an amazing amount of science fiction. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, and and so he supported himself as a writer. Mm-hmm. This is what he did for a living. Is he wrote, and he was a very prolific writer. Probably the only other writer I even know of in the same league with him in terms of amount of writing would have been Isaac Asimov. He also wrote a lot of science fiction, but he was a really prolific writer. I think that's so, where people just immediately go to the dismissing is because science, you know, science fiction and fantasy is, is not real in a lot of people's minds. So that's yeah, yeah, why they, got it. yeah, they, uh, they automatically dismiss it because, because of that fact, it is, is that's why I think people just put up a wall immediately and go, oh, no, 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 no. Keep that nonsense well, let, from here, me. Let me, let, me, let me respond to that in a couple of ways. Yeah. So let me finish the part on what knowing. So what knowing mm-hmm. does not mean you uh, – let, let me go back to the example of walking. I promise I'll take each question. No, you're fine. Go how, ahead. How long it takes. Trust me. There's going to be a lot of people very interested in this. So okay, take your time. Cool. So if we said – knowledge is not data. So if I said, if a guy walked into a room, I could make the statement, he knows how to walk. We get this now. Yep. Does this, does this imply or say that he has a lot of data about walking or he has written books? It doesn't mean anything. He knows how to do it. Mm-hmm. So you could have someone, you see this in universities, a person has tons and tons and tons of data. They can't do a damn thing in life with it. They, they can't really think straight and go out and produce something. But you get someone, when this person knows something, it implies they can apply it and do it. Get, get that difference. You could get somebody who's an art critic go, I think so-and-so is a terrible painter. Okay, that's an opinion. Mm-hmm. But can they paint? So people who study art in the university usually don't learn to create art. They learn the names of paintings and the what kind of paint was used, the stuff that, uh, like, like I hired a girl one time, and she had a master's degree in art history. And I thought, what a useless degree, anything <laughs> that she would ever have learned, if I wanted to know it, I could find it in just a few minutes on Google. Oh, yeah. There's, uh, a, there's a lot of degrees out there, I think, at universities supply that are 1,000% yeah, yeah. useless. So when we talk about knowledge, we're talking about being able to apply something. To it's real a, life. It's different. Yeah. Yeah, you could do something with it. So Scientology means quite literally knowing how to know. But if I say it's an applied religious philosophy, so applied would you say at once it's something you use, religious in the oldest sense of the word, a study of wisdom about the human spirit. And I'll come back to that. So talking about knowledge, um, 
I, I think it's pretty well known now about your the books that you have to buy to be in Scientology. Is it a requirement? So if I join Scientology, say tomorrow, and I know you guys have those uh-huh. books that you have to buy, what, how much, what, how? Well, first of all, let me stop you right there. Yep, There's go ahead. Nothing you, you don't have to buy a book. Okay, good. I'm going to tell you, I've never seen someone become a Scientologist who didn't like to read. I'll start with that. Yeah. Like if they, if they can't or won't read, they're not going to like Scientology because they won't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like you guys have I a was, pretty extensive library of your books. Yeah, yeah, but let me let me just make a couple of points here. Mm-hmm. You, you could say it's expensive to go to Meta. The books. I mean, I, I'm going to give you a link before we're done here today. Perfect. That anyone can go download to their heart's content uh, all kinds of booklets that they can read for free. It's available in. I don't know every language, but most major languages. Uh, if we start with English, I can tell you all of the books are available. These little booklets, I'm going to give you a link mm-hmm. that you can send out or put it with the podcast so that anyone at any time. Yeah, we're starting to like use to we're starting to use links on um, our things now, so I will definitely add that to it. Yeah. So this is this is not this. this I've already paid for the rights to distribute this broadly. So it's not like it was $25, by the way. This wasn't when I got some other little CD set that I gave away. <laughs> but, but my point is, uh, it's something that I, I'm not trying to sell something here. This isn't mm-hmm. like you need to sign up. But I found that people who can read and understand what they read gravitate to Scientology. And people who, when I, before I became a Scientologist, I knew about it and I was really intrigued. Mm-hmm. And I asked, I went around asking people, uh, I guess they all had in common, they weren't me, so I guess they must have known something I didn't know. <laughs> this was my assumption at the time. I don't know how else I it. And I, and I went around asking people, what do you think of it? And I'd run across some people that would go, I don't like it, it's no good. And I'd other people, no, I, I don't want it at all. And I'm, I'll never forget this guy. I cannot remember his name, but I can still see his face. And this would have been... Probably summer, yeah, summer of 1973. And and I asked him, what do you think of Scientology? And it was, just, this really surprised me. He says, oh, it's wonderful. And I said, really? He goes, oh, God, yes. I, I wasn't a Scientologist at the time. And, and he said, it's just, it's wonderful. I, I just the nicest people. And I said, well, have, have, are you a Scientologist? And he said, no. Uh, I said, what makes you say it's so great? He said, I've just met uh, quite a few people who are Scientologists, and every one of them, was they were really nice. <laughs> oh, wow. And you're like, well, sign me yeah. up. I want to be nice. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. else that you talk to. <clears throat> well, it was interesting. He was, he was himself really nice. And what I realized when he said that, I said, do you know any, you have any information? Have you ever done a course? And he says, no, but I, to all these people that I met, I, I really liked them. And what I realized at that moment is he had an opinion on a subject that he factually knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. And his was a positive opinion because he was a pretty positive guy. And the other people had an opinion also, not that they based on any experience or knowledge, because they didn't like it. Yeah, because it's so different. But what I was looking at was that person, like, Oh, I think you're you're breaking up a little bit. I don't know if you're moving around. Yeah, it just it just sounds like you're underwater. Oh, I'm not underwater. I swear. <laughs> no, uh, I trust you. Okay. But, but what I'm saying though is that people have an opinion on things they know nothing about. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no exception. I think that goes and for so, any any career, any religion, any anything out there for sure. If you know nothing about, you're automatically going to be extremely judgy and put off on it. And what you'll make up, they'll make up, they'll invent data when they have none. Mm-hmm. It's like you can ask someone, "Do you know what time is?" No, but you can ask people questions. Do you know about blah blah? No, and they'll start to explain, uh, even though they don't know. So it's interesting. It's only the brightest people who have an awareness oh, yeah. of what they don't know. That, that's, you find that in every profession, if you ask a really smart lawyer or a really 
excellent doctor a question that they don't know the answer to, they're aware that they don't know yet. Correct. So, so here we're talking about an applied religious philosophy, and I'll come back to religious, but what, let's talk about philosophy, because this is the key. I've given, if I said to you, several thousand talks over the years on the subject of Scientology, and I always like to, I would raise my hand and say, by a show of hands, how many of you be a philosopher? Mm-hmm. And there usually be, if it was a good sized audience, one or two people that would raise their hand and laugh. Yeah, I'm a philosopher. Mm-hmm. And but the truth is, I'd say every one of you, every every single person who can hear this, is factually a philosopher. You you may not have your philosophy written down or typed up or you're not trying to sell versions of it, but you have ideas. So I'll take you. You have ideas about how things are, how they ought to be, what's fair, what's not fair, what's justice, what's an injustice. What are good goals? What are bad goals? And those ideas about how things ought to be and how one ought to go about changing them or keeping them the same, those, that collection of ideas is your philosophy. And if every area of your life is going just exactly like you want it to go, then I would say to anyone, sir, people that go, I know I love everything in my life. I go, awesome. You've got a wonderful, I don't use this isn't necessarily the way I think of it. Yeah, I don't You've got a wonderful philosophy. Yes. It's wonderful. What I would suggest is write down what you're doing. So if you later run a back and go, oh, I changed this, that was the successful action. But the truth is everyone has ideas. Now, are they good? Are they good ideas? Are they ideas that get you where you want to go? Is, am I making sense so far? Yeah, that? no, I, I understand. I mean, I think there's going to be a little bit of struggle for other people to kind of follow. But basically, in a nutshell, what you're saying is it's a philosophy to follow. And that's because of basal, you know, facts. Like you said, the man walking in a room, he obviously knows how to walk. He's not writing books uh-huh. on it, but he has a philosophy of I can walk through this room because I know how my legs work and how the door works and, you know, my pants work. Yeah, yeah. And, so I get that. Um, but going into, yeah, yeah, go ahead. going into, s- yeah, the C organization. So mm-hmm. I know that Ron was a officer of the Navy. Um, uh-huh. My husband as well uh, was in the Navy as well for 11 years. So he actually had the biggest questions around this because he's a big Navy okay. guy. And um, so the C organization, why is it? a billion years to connect your soul to that? Like what's, what's with the 1 billion years? So the first thing to cover, like the answer that question directly, and I'm going to circle back to the religious part in mm. just a moment. Yeah. But to answer the question, so what, what Mr. Hubbard, the first came Dianetics, and that was the subject of a mental subject. It mm-hmm. actually covered the mind. And I'll cover that to as much detail as you want. But the following year, that came out May 9, 1950, in, in uh, July 1951, oddly in Phoenix, Arizona, Ron Hubbard scientifically validated the existence of the human spirit, period. And I'll cover how that occurred and all of that. I actually did well, not know that. That is, oh. you just blew my mind right now. Yeah, well, that's what the, so it, we then had the subject. It went from Dianetics, which was a mental subject of how the mind works, to a study of life itself, because this, the discovery of what's commonly referred to as the soul mm-hmm. wasn't a philosophic haphazarding or wouldn't it be interesting. It was a scientific validation that the being had a mind and he has a body but that the individual being is immortal, period. So the C organization was formed, I believe, in 1967. And it was some Scientologists, very dedicated Scientologists, that basically were working with Mr. Hubbard. And it became eventually known as, and they had gone on a sort of this trip doing some research on um, 
his memories, uh, his personal memories of some of his past lives. And he was drawing maps and saying, okay, if we go over here, we should find a big boulder and near there, there's going to be some buried treasure or whatever. I can't even remember. It's been so many years since I read the book. But my point is the original people that were on that mission with him were the originals known as the Sea Project. It became, uh, as it grew and grew, and as the subject grew and grew, the Sea Organization, which is sort of like if you think of, I don't know, monks or an ecclesiastical order of mm. like within the Catholic Church, and you would have it, the hierarchy would be the Jesuits. I think most this people just like, get so confused because they're wearing like sailor outfits, and they're like, what the heck? <laughs> I think yeah, that's what throws so a lot naval. of people off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but it's, 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 not, it's very organized. They're basically saying, I'm all the way in. This is it. For your entire soul forever. Well, it's, yeah, but let's take out the your soul because no one has a soul. Let me start with that. Okay. Like the, the concept of your soul implies that you're your body and you aren't your body. You are your own immortal soul. So if somebody says my soul, they're, they're, what, what are they referring to? Because you are the spirit. You are the individual who comes back, not the body. But can, can your body die? It's going to. Can you die? Nope. The closest you can come to dying is forgetting. Like you can forget you lived before mm -hmm. and you can pretend to yourself that you're a hunk of meat, but it's not true. It just simply isn't. You are immortal and you're going to be around for a very long time. What you do in your current life is going to influence how Earth is in your next one, uh, quite literally. So uh, people who take a long-range view, so it's, you could say the C organization members are in for the long game, the very long game, and it's a very dedicated group of people, uh, period. But I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, it's just I think the billion years just threw a lot of people off, but it makes sense about your soul. It, it's not you like your body, like your body is just the shell. Your soul yeah. is is the part that it's talking about. So it makes sense. I think the sailor outfits were just throwing everybody off, but not a lot of people knew actually that Ron Hubbard was a naval sailor and an officer. Um, the only thing was crazy is I didn't know this either until I looked into it today that he actually – uh, was charged with fraud, and so were 28 other higher-up members of Scientology. But the weird thing is, I will tell you this, it did not mm -hmm. directly tie to the religion. I think it was outsider stuff that they were doing. That Well, that, that actually, what occurred was uh, he, he literally, the, the e-meter, which was the device that was invented, I don't think Mr. Hubbard actually invented it, different electronic wizards mm -hmm. did, and it is what enables uh, the highest level and accurate uh, auditing. Like to, it, re it basically reads on thought, and it, it finds, like, it, it's, it's not a lie detector, and the e-meter the e was at one time labeled by the Food and Drug Administration. This goes way back. I mean, this is yeah, it said 50s. it was a long time ago this all yeah, came yeah. up. And they confiscated him and said that it was being used to diagnose illness, and therefore it was practicing medicine without a license. And that was where all that crap came from. And it's been literally proven time and time again. It's, it, no, it, we're not diagnosing illnesses. We're not curing illnesses. We're not uh, telling you. There's signs in every Scientology organization. So it just Earth. reads your mind and tells you things have happened in the past? Yes. You, you get to see what happened that's been, that you've basically been hiding from yourself, and then you can resolve some issue. Uh, and it's not that, it, you know, does, does enough auditing in certain areas cause some illnesses, not all, but cause some illnesses to sort of fall away? Yes. But we're not diagnosing the illness Correct. or giving it a name. Is this machine still around? Oh, God, yes, and a, and a better version of it than ever. It's absolutely around. How um, how do you guys get access to it? Like, does everybody in Scientology have access to this? Every auditor, the, the spiritual counselors, have to have them for their training. 
So an advanced auditor is an expert on reading the different meter phenomena. Oh you my have, God. You know what I would do it, to pay somebody to get, to go through this? I would pay a lot of money. <laughs> I would. Because well. <laughs> I believe, I believe that um, our time here on earth, like right now, like this moment, like you and I mm-hmm. talking right now, uh-huh. we have both been here before. Do we remember, yeah. like you said? No. But I have a true belief that if you go through life, I mean, whether mm-hmm. I did anything wrong or not, in my mind now, I came back here for a reason. Either A, I had unfinished business. I didn't get to go all the uh-huh. way through. Or B, I just fucked up so bad in my past life that I needed to come back and, you know, render my wrongs basically and redo everything. And until you get it right, and once you get it right, that's when you get to move on to the next phase. Well, moving on, let me let me take that up. Oh, yeah, so, and then I was going to get to that, the moving on yeah. part about Venus. So when you die, isn't there a thing where you guys believe you go to – it's Venus first, right? Or something no, like that? no, okay. that's complete crap. Okay, so here, here's, that, that is something there's, there's, going around the internet like wildfire. Yeah, so. It's just silly. It's just <laughs> it's absolutely silly. crap. Here's the thing. There, because at one time, this was in 1952, uh-huh. Mr. Hubbard was doing research to find out what was the ideal uh, condition for growing a plant. And he took a fast-growing plant, he used tomatoes, and he had an e-meter hooked up to literally a tomato. And to see what was like, how much, what was the optimum amount of water? What was the optimum amount of plant food? Uh, what was the optimum amount of light? But he was checking these things and he would see whether it was hurting or helping the tomato. And he found, by the way, that a number of things made a difference. And I'm not smart enough on that subject to start describing here's all the different things he figured out on tomatoes, but he, he knew. You're talking a life form, whether it's a tree. You know, there was a book years ago called The Secret Life of Plants. And you could have like a plant would respond to classical music favorably and a, the same plant. Oh, would yeah, respond. I've heard I've heard of that. So basically, so these, these are tips. <clears throat> he, what he was getting to was trying to figure out what was the best way to survive. How does that correlate to what happens after you die? Well, that wasn't it was just part he was dealing with a life form. OK, so. What he found when he first did his initial research in 1948 and 49, it looked to him like these memories, uh, he used the word engram to describe, and that was an incident containing physical pain, unconsciousness, or and a real or fancied threat to survival. But what was interesting is that he thought these memories were stored in the body on a cellular level because that's how it seemed to be. Yeah, it seems to me that way as well. And uh, he had sufficient research, but he didn't claim to know that in the book. He said, I really can't, I can tell you on function, I, I, this was in the Dianetics book, but I cannot say on structure. I, I can't, it looks like it's a trace on a cell. And you can even look that up in a regular English language dictionary and find engram. The definition of it is trace on a cell. But he found in July of 1951 that the memories were not, in fact, you could have some stored in the body, but the memories of the being were not stored in the body. They were mental image pictures. And the source of the pictures was the spiritual entity. You are the first source of the pictures, and these this, this giant collection of pictures that a being takes. He's, he's taking the pictures constantly. When I say picture, I don't mean just visio, like a picture you might have from being in the womb would have sort of blackness. Um, yeah. But any anything you could perceive, anything you could be aware of directly or indirectly, is stored in, in mental image picture form: body position, joint position. Uh, heart rate, uh, saline content of the blood. I mean, if it's if it's something a person could be aware of, it's being recorded, and so you have this giant collection of pictures. Everyone does, 
And the ones you can see again, you think of as your memory. Mm -hmm. And the ones you can't see, you tend to think of as your subconscious mind. But what, what's interesting is if you go back to, and, and, and the breakthrough that Hubbard had the advantage of when, before he did his research on Dianetics, was the work of Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud had discovered that this sub-mind, which Freud called the subconscious, sub, uh, Freud never pretended to know what it was, he just knew that it was, the sub-mind could cause a person to think of something they didn't want to think of. These are called obsessions, usually, or prevent the person from thinking of something he did want to think of. And those are usually referred to as inhibitions. Uh, to cause the person to say things that he himself couldn't believe he just said. He's like, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Yeah. Or it could prevent the person from saying something. And, and and then it could also make the person do stuff and not do stuff that they actually wanted to do or wish they hadn't done. And it could make their body sick. Freud knew all of that. What Freud attributed it to was sex, but not because he was a sloppy researcher, but he was actually looking in his research at the time Sigmund Freud did his research. He was researching the time when sex was the most inhibited thing possible on a communication line. So naturally, when the two souls in, basically connect. Well, not even the souls connecting, but it was a, you weren't supposed to go around talking about it. Yes, it, it, like what Freud. Was, so basically, it was very hush hush. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And people become aberrated on any subject that they're not allowed to communicate about. Mm. You, you could make it food. It's not. It's not like you must. You must always sit at the table and don't discuss the potatoes. You'll find people that, in their background, they're kind of nuts on the subject of potatoes or whatever the subject. I'm yeah. not going to re-stimulate someone, but my point is. So Hubbard found that there were lots of things that could be sitting there, and he figured out how to get at it, and this was amazing. And that was the book Dianetics. He actually figured out how a person could read that book, just literally read that book, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, and know and understand the human mind. Yeah, but, but the yeah. depth that we're getting into right now, if my mom was sitting here especially, her, her mm -hmm. face would be blown because her and I have always had some deep, deep conversations on, yeah. on you know, the afterlife and da-da-da-da and, like, uh -huh. your soul and stuff. And... It is damn close in line of exactly what you're saying right now. Mm -hmm. The out of body, and this is just basically like a holding shell, and like it, and this yeah. and that. And it's crazy because, you know, a lot of people I do, you know, are really good friends with are religious, and, mm -hmm. and they have different beliefs than us. And it's just so crazy that I've never looked into Scientology like this and to think that that's how you guys believe souls are. That's pretty damn spot on to what you know what the deep conversations I have with my mom without knowing yeah. a single thing about you guys that uh -huh. I'm pretty fucking well, here's close. The thing. <laughs> Scientology. Scientology is not a religious practice. So And that's what everybody been... gets wrong. So I'm really glad you said that just now because it's a religious philosophy. There are yeah. Jesuit priests <clears throat> you want to say like here you could could you have a rabbi be a Scientologist? Yes. Yeah. Could you have a Mormon? Could you have a Jesuit priest? Mm -hmm. There was one I know of who was in France. He was a Jesuit priest in France, and he was a Scientologist that went all the way up the line. And, and the only point I'm making is this does not cause him to leave Catholicism. It, it See, Catholic or Mormon is a religious practice. Yeah, you and, guys are but, just philosophy, basing off say, things on facts and things that you learn from. Right, and, and you, you you form your own opinion when someone says, "Well, what are you talking? What what do you teach about God?" Nothing. Yeah, literally the, the, the nothing. Thing, there isn't. A lot of people get that could. wrong, and a lot of people assume that you guys believe in Satan, which I couldn't believe. So no, I did a little social. So I got no. a. So, I did a social media <laughs> experiment for you, and I had mm -hmm. asked on social media what would be a question that you would want to mm -hmm. ask a Scientologist. You wouldn't believe how many fucking people I got that asked if you guys believed and worship Satan. <laughs> I was like, I don't even yeah, know well, very no. much it, about Scientology, but I'm going to go ahead and answer this already for him. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's here's what Scientology teaches. 
what's true for you, this is the most important thing I know to teach. And, and this is like if I say, what's the, pick one, one, one day. Mm-hmm. What's true for you is what you've observed for yourself to be true. Yeah. Everyone's going to have their different opinions. So even if you show somebody a white rabbit in front of them, someone's going to be like, no, Mm -hmm. it's a cream rabbit. No, that rabbit has a black stripe. Like there's going to be different versions of what you see. Even though we saw the same goddamn rabbit, we're all going to have like 14 different opinions about this rabbit. So I I get what you're saying there. Um, I think the biggest thing, I think, you know what? If you guys didn't have David uh, Miscavige, is that how you say his last name? Mm-hmm. If you guys didn't have him, I think a lot of this controversy around Scientology would just go the fuck away. He is, I can tell you, he is, I don't know him well personally, yeah. but he is the most astounding. He's brilliant. <clears throat> He's the most amazing executive. The, mm-hmm. Under his guardianship, I guess I would call it, the yeah. church has expanded and prospered like never before. It, oh, yeah. It's, amazing. it's boomed since then, but there's just so much heat and controversy on him. No, but let me tell it's you why. Crazy. Let, me, let me tell you. Let me, I know, but let me tell you the real reason why. So pretend, just as an analogy, you were trying to find out about a guy from his ex-wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. And it's funny that you say that because his ex-wife has been missing for what, eight years now? No, she hasn't been. No, she hasn't been. <laughs> I know. I, saw, refer- I no, saw a couple she, things she, on she, there. She, yeah. It's literally, that is like out of Leah Remney's insane imagination. I met Leah Remney and when I spoke to her, she did not seem crazy. Uh, she seemed a little, I don't know. I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but she did not seem nuts. I talked to her numerous times. Oh, you're talking about it. Leah, the one that did the documentary, the one from Kings yes. and Queens? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yes. That and documentary Leah, blew me away. And I yeah, think it's all this crap, is. But what, the, that's but what, what I'm saying. It's on my question list for you, actually, was to ask what you thought she about got, her. She got kicked out. She literally got kicked out. She, <laughs> she, went, she went when uh, she, was, she was invited. To, this is a true story that she left that out of the uh, documentary. She went, she was invited to Tom Cruise's wedding. Mm-hmm. And he had chartered, I don't know, planes in a castle in France or something. I just, well, I wasn't on the invitation list. But what I do know. Darn it. How come is, you weren't on yeah, there? How dare I you? Know, I know. <laughs> it, it's a really oversight on his part. <laughs> of course. When I see him, I'm going to say, listen, you know who I am on Facebook. I but know I thought, you're a celebrity yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. So he, anyway, what makes this fantastic? She was seated in the back, not up with like Travolta and the other dignitaries and so forth, mm-hmm. uh, but she wasn't considered important enough to sit up front. But she took it upon herself at the wedding to go up to the front and start screaming at Mr. Miscavige, "Where's Shelley?" And she was escorted off the premises and kicked out, at which point she then contacted the uh, Los Angeles Police Department and said he has either murdered or uh, is holding his wife hostage. Mm -hmm. So two detectives from the Los Angeles Police Department who were trained in this exact sort of thing made a visit to the Scientology headquarters and said, we want to talk to Shelly. And Shelly came out and talked to them. They sat and they interviewed her, I don't know, three, four hours. And these were guys trained on the subject. Are you being held against your will? She said, no, this is my life. This is, I'm a C-Org member. This is what I do. I'm happy with what I do. I work here and I'm happy. And they went back and told her, they went back to LA. They were in Hema, California. They went back to Los Angeles and called her back and said, we are closing the file. There's, she's not being held against her will. At which point she then accused the police of being paid off to say that. Yep. She did say that. uh, It was her and one other guy. She's crazy. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's just crazy mm. shit. I mean, that's just the kind of stuff where you thought, okay, uh, I don't know what else I'd say 
other than. That's but it enough. is interesting, though, that him and Shelly got a divorce, though. He's with somebody else now. And nobody's... I don't know. Yeah, they're not I, together I anymore. Know. And then no one's heard or seen from Shelly. So after they yeah, got a divorce. I, I don't really know. I don't know that. I can't comment. What I know is. What I just the part I told you, I'm yeah, that is very interesting. That and I yeah, don't. she did not mention that on the documentary, so that's very interesting. Yeah, no, she left that out. So, I want this is why I use the analogy mm. of imagine if you were trying to find out, so just based on a girlfriend of yours, and the only thing she's just some guy you're finding out about. Him. I remember a woman I knew, her, her name was Sherry, this was years ago, and she described her husband at the time as this monster. And then when I met him, I was expecting to meet a monster. And I thought, this isn't a monster. That's uh, all about perception. <laughs> yeah. Well, I drink so, a lot too. So am I a monster? <laughs> yeah. But, but my point is, sometimes you get someone when, if, if you, how would I say this? When people are hypercritical of someone else, mm -hmm. here's what I know always. The person who's extraordinarily critical, this just works out this way, and I'll send you the link, one of the little booklets, explains this. Uh, but when a person is highly critical of another person, it's because the other person they're critical of almost are nearly found out, which is to say made them wonder whether or not they knew about some person, the other person's misdeed. It'd be like if, if somebody does something that they shouldn't have done, violated their own moral code, like the person has violated their, you see it in marriages, but if the person has violated their own moral code, I'm not talking the law, I'm talking their ideas of what's fair, right, and just, and they break that rule, and then somebody else says something or does something that makes them go, know about this does he not know about this yeah and they start manufacturing things wrong with the other person to justify the way they feel which is now they start getting critical but that critical thought comes from the other person nearly found out something about them and now they kind of go crazy this is the reason let's go back for a moment to the catholic church and their idea on the subject of confession was mm -hmm. it a good one yes was it effective? Almost, but not really, because you find the same people back in church week after week confessing, confessing to the same to, Yeah, I still can't stop being a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, Help me, here's Jesus. Why. Here, here's why. Here's the reason why. And Hubbard <laughs> found that, too. So when a person has done something, let's just, I want to use an example, so I'm not trying to re-stimulate anyone. Yeah. Let's pretend it stole a cookie. Let's just call the trans transgression stole the cookie. Okay. So the person steals the cookie and it wasn't their cookie, but they took it. And now they've eaten the stolen cookie. Okay. And they broke their own moral code when they did it. And now they see someone, I don't know, a little kid and mama goes, hi, honey. Oh God. Does she know? Does she not know? She couldn't and then know. And the paranoia starts. Yes. And that missed, the other person missed something the person was withholding. And when a person has enough transgressions, like you find agents who are critical, I hate buyers, they're liars, and this kind of stuff. What does mm -hmm. that tell me at once? Yeah. That agent has numerous transgressions of omission or commission against buyers. It also they, goes in they hand broke with... an appointment, they got there late, they said something that wasn't true. When a person's critical of all buyers, they have transgressions against their buyers. They see this is just because this is why they're critical. And you could see some other agent. Oh, I love my customers. They're the greatest people in the world. I'm so happy to have these customers. And that's a very different thing than they're all no good sons of bitches. But yeah. the person who thinks the other class of people is no good sons of bitches, they themselves have transgressions against them. Is it kind of like the same it. thing where if like a spouse cheats and then they assume their other spouse cheating and then they yeah. blow up this whole yeah. shit on them because they're yeah. doing something bad, but the other spouse isn't. There you go. That's go exactly on. what you just said. That's exactly the same. Thing. So I wonder what, and, and, what David found out about Leah to make her go full 
you know, crazy on this. And I make don't it know. I can just tell you, I don't know. I couldn't, I can't, that's the kind of stuff I told you at the beginning. If you ask me stuff, I don't know. I, that's very interesting. I, don't know. I will say she's not the only one. There's, there's a lot of people who have uh, abuse stories about David. Like I know. A lot. I'm, I'm, yeah. So do you think but maybe at least maybe one or two or a few might be true or it's all speculation I, at this point? I, I can't say. I, yeah. let's, let's say theoretically, yes, but I still don't know. I yeah. don't have, I, if I wasn't there, what I know is that people who were there aren't there and they've made a small career out of saying how awful it was. That I'm, I understand. They also but, said, too, but, that there was people that work for Scientology that are like a PR type of uh, company for Scientology. And if say, say I write a bad article about Scientology, I mean, I never would, but I, if I did, um, there's a PR person that works for Scientology that will go out and then write like a hundred bad articles, like about me to no, deflect. Here's the thing. First they they all, said all that too. And so I was, and I was very intrigued. Like that's pretty aggressive. <laughs> it, it is, but it, I, I don't believe this is my answer. I mm -hmm. do not believe there's an outside firm. I, I don't think there's any outside firm that would be as smart as the Scientologists who handle that area for the church themselves. That, that's my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's a good I, answer. I see, well, it's, but it's my, it's my observation. At one time, this is way back, uh, when this would be in the 80s, there was a firm hired that was later dismissed, but they were some really wonderful PR people, but they never, they never, they, they came with the proposal, but it was the uh, Jack Trout and Al Rees uh, who started the, you might remember a book called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind. Brilliant people, both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack, Jack Trout passed away a few years ago. Al's still around, but I think their stuff on marketing is, uh, like one of my favorite book on marketing is Al Rees, uh, the uh, 21 Immutable Laws of Marketing. How many so books I, do you own and how much money have you put into Scientology? <laughs> I couldn't, I can't answer that. No, I don't mean I won't answer. I can't tell you. I don't know. Because that was I one thing Leah said on her documentary that she had dumped in hundreds of thousands of dollars in these books. And she even said, she's oh, like, I probably couldn't even no. give you a full number of how much money I, I put I, into this. I, first, no, it's not, it's not anywhere. I be like a, a, a small fraction of. Oh, that. okay. I mean, okay. If you said, do I own all the books? Yes. Do I own all the lectures? Yes. <laughs> Is it some number? I don't know for all that stuff. Maybe. 15,000 or something, but it's not anywhere near that kind of Yeah, crap. she made it seem like you got to basically pay like a house worth amount of money. No one's going to ever tell me what to think. Let me start with that. No one's going to tell me what to believe. Mm -hmm. My answer to someone who says you have to believe X is go, go fuck yourself. Yeah. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> like I, I couldn't, I couldn't be more clear about it. I love that like, about you. you no, nobody tells me what to think. I arrive at my own decision. And so do you. Mm -hmm. Like, no one's going to announce, well, no, if you're going to be, like, there are some rules. Like, at a certain point, if somebody's, like, let's say, drunk all the time, they would be told, well, you can't drink and get auditing, or you can't drink and show up for class, and you do that kind of stuff. How often do you have but, to meet for class for Scientology? It depends on the class. I mean, there's some of them. You might be there five, six times a week. And some of them might go once a week. It depends if at the introductory level, it's not, you can show up pretty much whenever you, your schedule permitted. Mm -hmm. how, extension, how high the, of a level are you at right now? Are you at the highest level you could be at or what level are you? Not the highest, but really high. I'm, I'm at a level called OT5. OT5. Okay. I think I remember that on the uh, documentary, not the Leo one. There is one more documentary out there that a, not a lot of people have watched. Um, it's like kind of like one of those uh, dorky sci-fi guys just went in to explain about Scientology. And he no, mostly I never just watch any of it. He mostly I, I talked just, about Tom Cruise, to be honest. <laughs> he didn't really talk yeah, about it much else. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, do you I, have any other? Have any... Do you have any other <laughs> celebrities like that, like uh, Leah and Tom Cruise? 
uh, with John Travolta. Oh uh, God, Travolta. I keep forgetting that he is too. Um, who is there? Any other big names? I'm going to say a few hundred, but not that big. I mean, like there's not that many people uh, as, as big as Tom Cruise. On, I mean, he's kind of in a league of his own. Yeah. Um, Have but, you met him? Uh, no, I've seen him, but I've not met him. But I mean, I, I don't know him. It's not like. Well, now you got to hurry so. up and meet him so you, I can come that <laughs> close to being with a celebrity. <laughs> well, so I... <laughs> here's the thing. I was in Scientology actively before Tom, before John Travolta. Uh, so I do not have, it's not that I don't respect them as actors. I think both of them are astoundingly good. But so is Nicolas Cage. I mean, there's, there's a lot. Of, I mean, I respect art and I respect artists. Mm-hmm. But it's not like, oh my God, a celebrity. Uh, I've so you been just treat around. him like a, like a regular person. Well, there's a celebrity unit that would handle him. But the truth is, there would be a certain set of rules that everyone follows if they're going to be around. Uh, like if you said, but yeah, here's an example Can you be active in Scientology and smoke pot? No. I just take that one. Is that a rule? Yes. Why? Because you can't get the auditing if, if within six weeks of having smoked pot. Mm. The rule for alcohol is 24 hours. Are do these you, arbitrary? Do you have to it, be in Scientology to get this auditing done? No. You could, uh, if you from an organization, but like I have a very good friend who does what's called field auditing here in the Valley. Uh-huh. And she's amazing. It's not on the meter, but she can sit down with anyone. I mean, if, if you went in there and talked to her and said, okay, can she audit you uh, on, I don't know, let's say you have an upset. I'm not trying to be stimulate, but it would be something you want handled, like the time my grandmother died or there's something that you've been sort of grieving for some time. She could lift that off to where it's completely handled. In maybe 10, 15 hours tops. I might like, have to hit you up after this for that because yeah, there is but I mean, something. Do you have to go and read, read anything? No, because that kind of auditing is a very different set of rules and you don't have to be anything. The first thing is, is like if you said to me, would I like to see you beyond be a Scientologist and go clear? I would love that. Mm-hmm. But am I going to ever say something to you to get you to move in that direction that isn't completely true. Yeah. No. I had actually and heard what, that the reason, and correct me if I'm wrong, the reason that you joined Scientology was because you had a family member that passed away and you needed help getting through it. Oh, that's not a true statement. Oh, no. so I'm right on there? No, that's not even remotely a true statement. Oh, I thought you said it was true. Yeah, that's what they no, said is no. that the reason that you joined was because you had a family member. No, that I don't know who said that, but it's not true. It was another uh, agent that, that knows you. Oh, well, he's wrong. <laughs> well, he's wrong. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. But... Uh, no, uh, the reason I, what got me started, what literally. Just all the facts I, and the philosophy. Well, sort of. I, uh went to, I was, my, my uncle, who was like a father figure for me, had a store, a furniture appliance store that I used to work at when I was much younger. And I had stopped by just to see my uncle John. He's passed away many years ago, but I just stopped by to see him. And he was on, had been on Scientology's mailing list since I was a young boy. And he had a copy of Scientology's advanced magazine there. That magazine still out, published by the Science of the Advanced Organization in Los Angeles. And I was just sitting there reading in the back, and I was reading the definition in the glossary in, in the back of the magazine, and I came across the word, and reading that definition blew me away. I had been spending, I had spent about a year delving into every uh, philosophy, religion, anything. I wanted to know, how did I get here on earth? Uh, what happens after you die? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I wanted to have it make sense, and it didn't make sense to me. I've been asking and, myself that my entire fucking life. Yeah, well, Those I'm exact you the questions. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you the word. The word was Satan. That's T 
T-H-E-T-A, like eighth letter of the Greek alphabet, theta, with an N added. And it's the word Scientology uses instead of soul or spirit to avoid confusion with earlier similar subjects. Maybe that's where people are getting the Satan shit mixed up with. Oh, it's the word Satan. And uh, I, I remember one time, oh God, years ago, when some woman I said, well, it's Satan. She said, Satan, I don't want that. I said, no, no, it's not that. And because someone had died, I don't remember who it was. This is like almost 40 years ago. The word, for the definition of Satan is the identity which is the individual, not your body, not your name, not your mind, but that which is aware of being aware. The identity that is the individual. Like I think of the, when you say, I want some water, I want to go to bed. I, the awareness of awareness unit, you are a Satan, a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated with reading that and I wanted to know more about it. It had nothing to do with anyone dying. Um, I mean, have I had some horrific losses of friends that died that I had? run them out. Oh, yes, I have. And you've been, uh, have you brief, had the auditing and stuff done on you? I'm saying it to me. Have you, have you had the auditing done on you? Well, I've had thousands of hours of auditing. Yes. Oh, God, wow. yes. What was the most I'm, memorable thing that you learned uh, after one of them? Well, it'd be during one of them. Oh, yeah, it during one. An uh, example that some of the stuff like anger that I used to have in my space, like uh, just rage, and I mean literally rage. Uh, the most horrific time was the Civil War, and, and I was a Union soldier. Um, and uh, I could go back to uh, Gettysburg, Manassas. Uh, I had been on those battlefields with stuck pictures all these years, uh, all these years. Uh, I could, it was just so horrific a sight, the things I saw and mm. the losses I had. And uh, so all that stuff was suppressed and I wasn't looking at any of it. I wasn't viewing it. All I knew is I was mad at Lincoln, President Lincoln, for having gotten into the war. I was mad at Lincoln, had been for years. Like when I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't know why. I just, I was, I was mad at Mr. Lincoln. Wow. He's actually and, one of my favorite presidents too. So I'm like, whoa, well, God, what did he do? Yeah, no, yeah, no. I know. <laughs> just, you understand. No, I, I have just, but now I'm not looking through this lunatic shit that's in the way. I yeah. cleared it all out. And I can uh, first I thought you were going for, well, real estate pissed me off. So I had to go have an auditing session. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no, those no, are no. much more serious uh, deals. It, it, no, I, yeah, I've had, there, there's, I mean, there's no such thing. If you said, have I had losses of people that I loved dearly mm. that were gut-wrenching? The answer is yes. Uh, did I get them run out in session? The answer is also yes. And so uh, I, I helped a woman uh, not too long ago who's, she's just a sweet, wonderful person. And, and, and her son had committed suicide when he was 16. And she was just still, when I first started talking to her, uh, and she has another child or two, and she has a wonderful husband, but she was still stuck in that the day he did it. Mm -hmm. And like it was her fault. And I found that when I'm helping someone, that whatever is bugging them, it's because they're trying to take responsibility and own something that doesn't quite belong to them, or they're not taking responsibility for something that does belong to them and refusing to own it. But a lot of times I can see what's wrong with someone and go, they, they have a stuck picture of something and they're sort of startled when I say, it's not yours. That, that that doesn't belong to you. Is this go then, correlate to the uh, the Way to Happiness Foundation, or is that different? Oh, I love them. I I I've purchased from my local org almost five thousand booklets uh, to give out for people just to hand them out, and I can get you a link for that online. I think I've the seen one happiness. of these before when I was at mm -hmm. um, a marketplace uh, dealio way no. before COVID, when we actually used to yeah. do that type of stuff. 
Um, but but anyway, yes, The Way to Happiness is a wonderful booklet. Uh, it's just literally wonderful. I, I couldn't say it. It's a non-religious moral code. And it's it, I, I just couldn't say enough nice things about it. And it's just an invaluable tool. And usually when you really see it, you go, I want to share this. I mean, it's not a thing like here you need to sign up for Scientology. It's just it, more fact, just have a good moral compass. And I'm, I'm yes. assuming this is going around to where people assume that Scientology wants to take over because they want to improve the world's situation. So wars, plagues, and corrupt people, and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, and yeah. I'm assuming where this is all... it's not a takeover politically. It's, yeah. It's literally. Let's, let's pretend. <laughs> like, let's go back to the goal. Seriously, let, let, what is the goal of Scientology? A world without war, without crime, without insanity. And that would be back, nice, was, but maybe kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And, and I'll tell you something, and because you're, you're, you think of the arts, mm -hmm. crazy does not make for better art. It just doesn't. I actually don't like those like, artist paintings where they just throw shit on walls and go, it's art, no, no. and I'm going to charge a thousand dollars. No, I hate that that's shit. not my favorite either. Good. But here, here's what I know is that art is good, aesthetics are wonderful, and war is there there isn't some plus to it. Yeah, um, we're literally going through that right now as we speak as we with speak. the the shit with Russia and Ukraine right now. Yeah. So literally so, as you and I are talking, uh innocent people yeah. are getting bombed. So it's not yes, a good deal. That's literally. So it, it's like what causes war is insanity. Mm -hmm. Like that's a crazy thing for someone to do to start a war. Correct. It just is. It's an insane thing. When we talk about insanity, it is not simply where they wore clothing that I don't like or they like music that I don't listen to. No. That's it, the it, mental part it, of it. Well, here's what it is. And it's something when I hear people talk about it, unless they can you define it. Well, if they're they're out of agreement with society. So was Copernicus. So were a lot of people that did some wonderful things. Every time, some of the, that, that's not a definition. Do they agree with idiots uh, <laughs> or agree with morons? But a definition, here's what insanity is. The overt or covert, but always complex and continuous determination to harm or destroy. I'll say it again. The overt or covert but always complex and continuous determination to harm or destroy. Which is true. And you find that like, crazy people want to harm others. They don't, it's not an accident. Like a crazy, it's, yeah, if you accidentally hurt one of your children. No, it's like my world you, ends. Like if that ever happened, yeah, but, but it hasn't happened this, yet. No. I mean, they, they hurt themselves. <laughs> I understand, but, but, but follow. If you did something that hurt their feeling, oh. you feel bad about it. Yeah, I do. Now, here, let's just make something a little obvious statement now. So that proves you're a good person. Because if you did something bad, you feel bad about it. Yes. An evil person does the bad thing and feels good about it. Yeah, no, I definitely do not. But get that difference. So crazy people harm others. And feel good about themselves. They, and they feel happy about harming others. Mm -hmm. They feel ha happy about destroying other people, other people's lives. Yeah, and that goes uh, in hand in hand with like bullying with kids that are that get off on hurting animals and laughing about there it you and go. hurting there people. You go. Those kids insane. scare me. Oh my god! Yeah. I'm like, that's a murder well, in the making, right there. Jesus. There you go. I agree. But <clears throat> when when you recognize evil on sight, and the fact that I don't know, let's take your husband. Has he ever gotten angry? Yes. Yeah. Does this make him evil? No. No. Has he ever said something that he later, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Of course he has. Yeah. But the point I'm getting at is he's a good person, and the proof is he immediately turns it, not immediately, but after he cools off, like, I'm so sorry, honey. I didn't mean it that yeah. way. It's more me, though. Everybody knows our relationship. I'm the batshit crazy one, and then I'm like, okay, I, I think I... <laughs> <laughs> I think I may have I overreacted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But you're still, you come to your senses. Oh, yeah, every so, time. 
Every yeah, time. Yeah. Sure. I think I have one mm. big question for you that sure. um, I actually got a lot of this, but it, I got this question in like so many different ways. So I'll just ask it yeah. in the most basic way ever. Um, uh-huh. Do Scientologists believe that they are descended from aliens? And don't laugh. Just try to bear with me here. I got this question a well, lot. <laughs> yeah, the answer is no. Okay, good. <laughs> but it, in a way, it's yes. Let me, let me say it this way. So the gibberish that gets spewed is what I'm going to classify as gibberish that gets spewed. Mm-hmm. So, but let's go, let's, if we call an alien someone who's not originally from Earth. Correct. We all, by definition, are aliens. Yeah, because I don't think we originated here. I mean, I think once Earth got created, what, like millions of years ago, we were somewhere else. Correct. And then we correct. took our little spaceships and said, you know, this is going to do. This is going to piss a yeah. lot of people off that really believe that two people just decided to fuck under a tree and eat an apple and create the world yeah. that way. But yeah. I'm definitely like logically speaking like you, like that definitely didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So let's say at one time, Australia <clears throat> was considered a dumping ground for criminals. Oh, my God. I literally just had an Australian episode, literally. And we talked about this. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I'm going to blow your mind about that. I'll have to send you the link for that. It's actually pretty funny. On an intergalactic level, Mm -hmm. this was a dumping ground. Yes. For people who were out of line. (laughs) So we are the space criminals, I see. Uh (laughs) So uh, other planets said, you know, we're going to drop them off on the blue planet over there. Does somebody need to believe in it? No. Ever. Not ever. Should they? Not really, because how would it help somebody? Do you think, well, if I could convince someone, and they couldn't, but let's pretend I could. Let's say I could convince a person by talking to them with a good sales pitch. Uh, and in fact, I, I remember one time a guy, and he's a very prominent realtor, and he had attended this class I was teaching on Hubbard's material on the condition. And it was the third time he had come to that same class. I used to teach the classes. Uh, I had four talks, and I gave each of them. Was the, he'd, he'd come to every one of them. This one he'd come to. This was the third time he was sitting through the class I taught. And I don't remember what I said, but I'll never forget him saying, I don't really understand that, but I know it's true because you said it. And I said, Jeff, it is not true because I've said it, and you don't know it's true because I said it. What you know is I said it. Mm-hmm. You only know and if it's what, true if it's like factual. No, you just. I said it doesn't matter how emphatically I said it. It doesn't matter how uh, certain I seem. That doesn't make it true. It's true if you can observe it's true, and the reason you don't understand it is because there's a word in the definition you don't know the correct meaning of. We're going to clear it right now. I had a class full of people, and I said, just read it out loud to me what it said. Just just start at the beginning of the definition. You've got it right there in your booklet, and just read it to me. And he did, and, I, and he fumbled on a word. And I said, okay, right there. What does that word mean? And he gave me a false definition, an inadequate, really, an incomplete definition. We cleared up the word, and, I, and he got it. And went, oh, I see. I said, read it again. And he said, Oh, it makes perfect sense. Now he knew it, and now it belonged to him. And he, he, the idea, you couldn't, I could tell you something, Amanda, and go, this is the deal. That doesn't make it true. Yeah. But let's say you look at it, and you go, wow, this is fantastic. I like it. It's mm-hmm. true to me now. And, but it doesn't, it's true if you've observed it. Like, why am I so certain Scientology is fantastic? Because it's been so fantastic for me. Yeah, it doesn't have to be for everybody. I like that it's a philosophy and not a a forced type of religious belief. There's nothing to believe. There's literally nothing. (laughs) Yeah, I I think that's my favorite part about this and a huge, huge misconception. And so I'm so glad you're actually saying the right words for people out there to hear this because... The wrong words out there in the universe and TV shows and, you know, the internet are being yeah. used. And you are using the correct words. <laughs> well, 
thank you, sweetie. Yeah. I'll tell you something. Like it makes else. more you sense. Can. Like you're a yeah. calm soul in a calm situation and you're explaining uh-huh. it exactly how it's supposed to be explained. And yeah. the fear souls, the 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 hurt, the angry, the irate, you know, men, in mental illness minds explain it in a different way. You're very. Okay. But I'll tell you a place to get a ton of data. Uh is if there's a network called, and it's magnificent, it's called Scientology.tv. Mm-hmm. And you can download the app on your phone. You can download the app uh, from uh, Roku or Amazon or uh, any direct TV. It's, it's on all of them. Mm-hmm. And it's got tons and tons and tons of information. Uh, and you can access it anytime you want. You don't have to sign. You don't have to fill out. And you just go whenever you're in the mood. I think that's the biggest thing watch. that people don't understand too. They think they just have to sign, show up to a award no. and then they have to pay all this money and then take no, all these no, classes. No, no. Think, so I'm no, glad no. that you're putting it out there how it really is. Yeah, and in fact, literally, you can get a book or two books or whatever from. Uh, you can buy them from Amazon. The only thing I'm saying, there's a point where let's just pretend you read Dianetics, then you read a book called Fundamentals of Thought. I'm just making these two up, but Mm -hmm. that'd be good enough. And you're like, oh, Jesus, I I want to know more. You'll show up. You'll just, you read those two and you're going to go, oh, where's that building again? Mm Because you're going to want to come see about it and learn more about it. Are you at the one that's that's near Biltmore that has all the vines on it, the brick building? Biltmore. It's at 44th Street and Indian School. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes. Is that the I only one? In Phoenix. Yes. Oh, that, that one. That used I used to drive by it all the time when I used to go to my uh-huh. old brokerage because my old brokerage was uh, just down the road from there. Oh, which company was that? Uh, I'll tell you offline, but because I'm not there. Okay. I'm not with them. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not trying to give them a plug. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you offline. <laughs> I'm yeah, I'm not with them anymore. I'm with Keller Williams right. now, so yeah. Well, they're a wonder. KW is a wonderful company. I oh think yeah, Keller. yeah. I, it's they're funny. Uh, Justin and I, our doorways face each other. Uh huh. <laughs> so he gets yeah. to listen to my loud ass every day. Well, <laughs> you're a delightful loud ass. But oh, anyway, thank this, you. I appreciate I, it. I have loved. I have loved this. Quite literally, I have just loved it. Yes, I'm and so glad to have you on the show. Like, you're literally going to blow a lot of people's minds and realize that awesome. there is a total other side to us. So I'm so glad we did this today. Oh, and, 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 and I don't mean to cut this. Actually, we've been going at it for like 100 or 100, an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And um, I will list all the links that you mentioned um, on yeah. our uh, YouTube because we do YouTube, Spotify, and Apple um, so uh-huh. I'll make sure all those links are on there in case anybody wants to know any any information. Sure. And, but, I'll, and I'll send you the links. I've got your number. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to thank you again. And it's my pleasure. Going forward, I think I might be hitting you up for some some audits. Uh, just saying, because okay. I might need help with some uh, past traumas. <laughs> Understood. So Understood. I'm here for it. But thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. It's my pleasure, sweetie. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon.